Okay. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. I don't know what I was expecting. Okay. Let's think here. Yeah. told me just to leave the mics on the on the table. Oh, I'll raise them with down. Uh, yeah, no question. Here we go. Thanks. <coughs> All right, I think we should start. Uh, this is the first colloquium of the uh, spring semester, and apparently message didn't quite go through. <laughs> I see people coming. Uh, Certainly coffee didn't arrive. Sorry about that, so we'll make sure that it will be served for the next colloquia. And uh, today we are very happy to have Matthew Klein from Michigan, uh, who uh, has been working on Atlas for quite some time. He got his bachelor's from Stanford, uh, actually not doing collider physics back then, but then he switched to collider physics at Columbia, where he got his uh, PhD in 2017. Uh, for searches for supersymmetry, and then as a postdoc at uh, UMich, he was uh, he switched to uh, Higgs physics, and he's going to talk uh, about Higgs decays to be quarks as the search tool and the measurement tool. Oh, yours. Great, and hopefully you can still hear me. I can still hear echoes. Great, thanks. Okay, well, if you're an active listener, you've probably gathered. My name is Matt Klein and I'm going to discuss Higgs decays to B quarks, both to study them in and of themselves and also as a probe for both standard model and beyond the standard model physics. So this is going to be a bit of a journey, so to give you a little bit of a roadmap for where we are and where we're going, I'm gonna start by discussing theory in terms of what kind of theories we're testing, why, and what the implications are on theory depending on what kind of measurements we make. And then I'll discuss the basic hardware we use for these measurements, which as we'll discuss later, are the Large Hadron Collider, and for the measurements and searches that I will discuss in this talk, the Atlas Detector. Then I will discuss Higgs boson measurements and searches, and I will in each case discuss one particular measurement or search in some detail, and then discuss a summary of other measurements to give you a general picture. Then I'll discuss the future needs and improvements if we want to further refine measurements and searches for the future, and finally, I'll discuss the outlook of the LHC, and in particular, focusing on how these different measurements and searches we make will impact the outlook for the LHC and for particle physics in general. Okay, for the uninitiated, because I don't know who here is in particle physics and who is not, as people, may have, as people probably have seen, the standard model gives our current understanding of what fundamental particle physics actually looks like. And in particular, it contains and describes all of the particles we now know or believe to be fundamental in nature. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail because that will require class, but to give you a basic overview, there's three fundamental forces in the standard model. There's the strong nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and the weak nuclear force. Then there's six quarks. The quarks interact through all three forces. Let's see, this laser does work. There's six quarks. Two of them in particular are the ones we interact with on a daily basis, the up quark and the down quark, because they make up protons and neutrons, which make up most of the matter that we interact with. Then there's three charged leptons, electrons, and then two others that are the muons and taus that are effectively heavier versions of electrons that interact with the electromagnetic and weak forces. And then there's three electrically neutral neutrinos, which are massless in the standard model, and only interact through the weak nuclear force. Then there's the gauge bosons, which mediate the forces. There's gluons for the strong force, photons for the electromagnetic force, and W and Z bosons for the weak force. Beyond this, there's one particle, which you probably guessed that I will talk about, which has a particularly special place in the standard model, which is the Higgs boson. 
the Higgs boson touches most other pieces of the standard model, and I won't go too far into the details, but effectively, it's responsible both for giving masses to all of the massive fundamental particles in the standard model, which is all of them except the neutrinos, the photon, and the gluon, and is needed for the self-consistency of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic and weak sectors. Now, a couple things to note about the standard model. The standard model is a complete theory in the sense that it is a self-consistent theory that could potentially describe nature. The problem is it doesn't. The standard model, while a self-consistent theory, does not describe everything we view in nature. There are many things we observe that are not explained by the standard model, the most obvious being gravity. Gravity clearly exists. You don't need a fancy telescope to show gravity exists. You can prove it just by jumping. Gravity is not explained by the standard model. The standard model is incomplete. Now, this has left particle physics in somewhat of an interesting position because in hindsight, it's easy to say, but in hindsight, the history of particle physics has effectively been a history of completing the standard model. 100 years ago, in 1900, we knew about two fundamental particles, the electron and, depending on how you count, the photon. Beyond that, we knew about protons, but protons we now know are not fundamental. And then, in hindsight, the following 100 years was effectively a history of completing the standard model. By the year 2000, we basically discovered all of the fundamental particles in the standard model, except one, which, if you're careful, you know which one it is. And this effectively told us, we knew that there had to be this other particle that existed that was not observed, which was the Higgs boson. We had the new accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, coming online. And this basically gave us a roadmap for where we could find new physics in the Large Hadron Collider. We knew the Higgs boson had to exist for the self-consistency of the standard model. We had a new detector in order to find it, such that we knew exactly where to look, such that just two years after the LHC began operation in 2012, we discovered the Higgs boson, or what looked to be the Higgs boson. And this has now left, standard, left particle physics in a somewhat interesting position, because we know the standard model is incomplete. We know from various pieces of evidence that it's incomplete. And depending on which branch of physics you work in, you've probably recognized at least one of these. This is just examples of things that are unexplained in the standard model that can be observed in nature, just to demonstrate the incompleteness of the standard model. The first being matter-antimatter is asymmetry. In the standard model, just to give a little bit of information, matter and antimatter are basically exactly the same with one key difference. But if that were true, we would expect approximately equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the universe produced from the Big Bang. In practice, very different amounts are observed, which shows there must be some asymmetry between, be, between the two that must be fundamentally beyond the standard model and must have a fundamental explanation that we don't know about. The second is dark matter. We know most of the matter in the universe is not what we observe in the standard model. Therefore, there must be some extension to the standard model to explain it. And the third that I'll mention is the hierarchy problem, or more, general, more generally, problems relating to naturalness, which effectively relates to the fact that there are certain constants in the standard model that have very convenient values for us, for life, for physics as we know it, but seem like they should or might as well take values that are wildly different from what we observe. And ideally, there would be some fundamental explanation for why they take values that are convenient for us. And this is just a subset. And just to mention, for each of these, we can propose extensions to the standard model that potentially explain them. For example, supersymmetry, which I won't go into too much detail, in the case of the hierarchy problem, new particles that you can add to explain dark matter in the dark matter case, and potentially modifications to the Higgs sector in the case of matter-antimatter symmetry. So we can propose extensions to the standard model but because there are many models, and because we don't necessarily know what makes the most sense and what can potentially be the most likely explanation for physics beyond the standard model, we have to effectively be very broad in how we look for physics beyond the standard model, because we know it exists, but we don't know exactly where to look. But the Higgs boson is kind of an interesting clue here, because we know the Higgs boson connects to most other pieces of the standard model, and therefore probing Higgs boson properties becomes a fairly model-independent way of probing physics beyond the standard model. So if we want to look for extensions of the physics of the standard model, which we know must exist, probing Higgs boson properties specifically becomes a very general way of looking for new physics. And we have a tool to do this. That tool is the Large Hadron Collider. It is a large collider of hadrons. The hadrons themselves are not particularly large. Effectively, it's this large ring. Everyone has probably seen this picture if you've worked on LHC physics because it's a pretty picture and it shows a fairly nice pastoral landscape. 
The LHC is this large ring. It exists under the border between France and Switzerland. It collides protons. It bear, effectively, you have one beam of protons going in one direction, one beam of protons going in the other direction. They travel very, very close to the speed of light, and they collide at four particular interaction points. And at each of those interaction points, you have an experiment that then looks at the products of these collisions. I will not discuss two of them in detail. Those are LHCB and ALICE, but, Elise, but you can read more afterwards if you're interested. But the two general purpose detectors are ATLAS and CMS, which have similar physics capabilities and look for similar processes and should be able to basically see similar things. And I'll discuss measurements with ATLAS specifically for the rest of this talk. So effectively, you have these beams, and beams are set up such that they collide in the center of the detector. But the beams themselves are not just solid beams of protons. The beams are divided into bunches of a huge number of protons. That such that you have one beam coming in one direction, one beam coming in the other, and things are oriented such that they collide at the center of the detector every 25 nanoseconds. And then every 25 nanoseconds, you have these collisions, and then you get a spray of particles going outward that hopefully you detect with this detector. This is actually a very complicated situation, and what I just described is a simpl simplification because you're not colliding individual protons, you're colliding bunches of a huge number of protons. The vast majority pass right through each other, but on average, every 25 nanoseconds when there's a bunch collision, you get about 40 different proton-proton interactions happening right on top of each other. Even this is a simplification because protons themselves are complicated. Protons are not fundamental particles. And generally, the thing we're really interested in is uh, an individual quark-quark, quark-gluon, or gluon-gluon interaction which means we actually have a very complicated picture of what an interaction looks like. This is just a schematic diagram of a single proton-proton interaction, just to show how complicated things are, because effectively we're, looking at, we're trying to look at a single small piece of a very complicated interaction with a lot of garbage and a lot of noise, where you have 40 of these happening on top of each other every 25 nanoseconds, which presents a very complicated picture for data analysis. And just to demonstrate why, I wanted to show this plot, which just shows approximately the number of proton-proton interactions we have as a function of time compared to the number of proton-proton interactions that are interesting, depending on what you find interesting. So a couple things to note. The x-axis is year. We're currently here. And this is approximately the full lifetime of the LHC. And the thing to note is, let's say we're looking especially interested in Higgs bosons. We've produced a lot of Higgs bosons. We've produced millions of them. And we expect to get orders of magnitude more by about a two orders of magnitude more over the full LHC lifetime. So we have a lot of data. We have a lot of data to analyze to actually measure Higgs boson properties. And the challenge of data analysis is generally not so much just collecting enough data to actually be able to make measurements, but separating it from this overwhelming background. The vast, vast majority of interactions are not that interesting. And we have to really sort out a small number of interesting interactions from this overwhelming background of fairly uninteresting interactions, unless you're really into soft QCD. Luckily, we have a detector. The detector hopefully can bring order to chaos. And this diagram is a diagram of the Atlas detector. The Atlas detector, generally speaking, the basic design philosophy is it can't do that many things, but it can do a small number of things really well. So it can't identify individual hadrons, for instance, but it has almost complete solid angle coverage, and it can measure the energy of just about everything. Effectively, there's three or four detector subsystems. There's an inner detector, which detects anything that's charged. There's a calorimeter, detect there's a calorimeter which detects either anything interacting electromagnetically or that's hadronic. And there's an outer part that's just dedicated to detecting muons. And just to show schematically how, here's a schematic diagram of what actually happens to different particles as they interact with the detector. So you have, as three examples, muons, protons, and um, electrons here, these are three charged particles that can be measured in the inner detector. Then you have this calorimeter system where you have an electromagnetic calorimeter which stops and measures photons and electrons and can be used to identify them. You have then this calorimeter, this hadronic calorimeter which detects anything hadronic like protons and neutrons. And you have this outer part that just detects muons simply because muons are the only thing in the standard model which can regularly pass through the calorimeter. One last particle that's worth mentioning is neutrinos. As people may be aware, we can't detect neutrinos directly. It's very difficult, even with a dedicated neutrino detector, it's very difficult to see neutrinos. But we can indi indirectly detect neutrinos because if you're looking at a single proton-proton interaction, we expect momentum to be balanced in the transverse plane. 
So if you add up everything that you see coming from an interaction and there's a momentum imbalance, you can generally guess that that's likely from a neutrino or from some other undetected particle that's beyond the standard model. So we can indirectly detect neutrinos, though it's not particularly exact. Now, I'm not gonna discuss how we identify other types of particles in too much detail, but the one particle I have to discuss in some detail is jets. So generally, as people may know from quantum chromodynamics, when you get quarks and gluons, or anything with color in general, these are not things that exist freely and not things that are, you can freely detect directly with a detector. In practice, when you get a quark or gluon, it forms this jet of lower energy hadrons, and these hadrons show up as a clump of energy in the detector, and this is what we can detect. And the thing that's notable about jets is we get a lot of them in the LHC, because proton-proton interactions produce a lot of jets, which produces a very complicated picture. Here's just one example of what happens from a proton-proton interaction schematically, where these are all jets. And part of the issue with jets and part of the reason data analysis is complicated is because, as I mentioned, we're looking at events with many proton interactions happening on top of each other, which produces this very complicated picture where you have to subtract off the effects from many neighboring collisions in order to actually get back to what you're looking for. This is all just to say hadronic processes with a lot of jets can be complicated in the LHC. Now, one other issue with jets is while we can measure energy of jets and we can see them, we cannot identify generally the origin of jets. We cannot distinguish jets produced from up quarks or down quarks or strange quarks. We can sort of distinguish gluons. But the one thing that we can do actually fairly well is identify jets coming from B hadrons, so-called B jets. And the reason is because when you get a B quark, B quarks form B hadrons. B hadrons have a sizable lifetime such that they can travel a few millimeters before decaying. And this is something we can actually detect with our detectors. And we can do this fairly well. I, this plot I'm not gonna go through in too much detail, but it's just to give an example performance. If we have about a 70 or 80% efficiency for identifying B jets, we, have, we can reject more than 99% of, of light jets, of things that are not charm jets anyway. So we can do fairly well, but it's not an exact thing. Now we get into the history of particle physics at the LHC. As people may recall, if you're old enough to remember, I think everyone here is old enough to remember if you're older than 10, which everyone appears to be. Um, the largest announcement from the LHC was the discovery of a new particle in 2012, which is now over 10 years ago. Here's just a snapshot of the excitement at the LHC at the time, July 4th, 2012. I was at CERN, not in the room at the time, because it was crowded and you had to get there early. But just a snapshot, it was, it was a very exciting time. And here's just the dis snapshot of the journal where it was announced simultaneously by CMS and Atlas for political reasons. So this was an interesting time, but it raises two important questions. The first is, this is just the discovery of a new particle. This is not necessarily the Higgs boson. So the first question is, is the new particle the Higgs boson? Because we expect deviations of what we measure for the Higgs boson from many BSM theories. So the way we answer this question is we make a lot of different measurements of a lot of different Higgs boson properties and see if they agree with what we would expect based on the standard model expectations. The other question is, is this bo does this new boson exist in isolation, or is it part of some larger theory? Because there are many models beyond the standard model, and we know BSM physics must exist, that predict that we will get something that looks a lot like the standard model Higgs boson, but in addition, we'll also get other new particles which may exist. So this comes to how we actually test physics, new physics at the, at the LHC. So effectively, there's two related, but somewhat philosophically different approaches here. The first is we make measurements. We expect deviations of, stand, of Higgs boson properties in many new models. So if we make measurements of a lot of different properties that we expect in the standard model, we can see if there are any deviations from what we expect. And this plot here is just showing from Atlas a summary of a lot of different standard model, standard model measurements where we just compare what we observed with what we expect in the standard model, look for any deviations. And I'll discuss one particular measurement in some detail, which is the measurement of H to BB bar in a particular final state. The other thing is searches. In this case, instead of measuring cross sections, we're really measuring, is there some new final state that we don't expect to exist in the standard model, which now appears when we do a search? So for example, is there a bump in some mass spectrum when we don't expect anything in the standard model? And in this case, we're really looking for something that is not expected and seeing if it's there, as opposed to measuring something we expect and seeing if it agrees with what we expect. 
And here's just a summary of a lot of different searches in Atlas, because again, as with measurements, the basic strategy is we perform a lot of searches, see if we see anything unexpected. And this is a summary for supersymmetry. This is the last time I'll mention supersymmetry, I promise, for the rest of the search. But you know, in practice, we have not found anything particularly unexpected so far. So now we have to talk a little about the Higgs boson properties. So this plot is just summarizing what we expect the Higgs boson to decay into in a standard model. So there's a couple things to note. The first is most Higgses are expected to decay to bottom quarks in the standard model. And this is, to put it simply, just because the Higgs couples more strongly to particles that are more massive, and the, BB, the bottom quarks are the most massive particles that the Higgs can decay into, such that they're both on shell. Or to put it another way, two times the B quark mass is less than the Higgs mass. So this is the most common. The second thing to note about this slide is I put here the year in which each of these decays was first observed. And the thing to note is you can kind of take this year as a measure of how easy that final state is to confirm that it exists. And the thing to note is that it's actually these rarer final states that were actually first observed. And the reason is because, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of Higgses have been produced. Millions of Higgses have been produced. So actually confirming that certain decays happen is often not a question of just producing enough Higgses to see that decay happen in, but instead to be able to distinguish these processes from background, because some of these decays are actually really messy and really hard to see. An example would be the decay to bottom quarks, which despite it being the most common in the standard model, it was actually discovered much later than some of the others because it's very messy. And you know, some of these other common ones, for instance, the gluons and charms are actually very difficult and not even probably possible in the LHC to confirm that they exist. Now, to go into a little bit more detail, it really becomes a question to see some of these rarer, or these messier final states, we have to understand how Higgses are produced, because there's a few different ways of producing Higgses. And the important thing is, even if you're looking at a messy Higgs boson decay, and even if you're looking at a situation where it's very difficult to actually identify event, events purely based on those Higgs boson decays, like in the bottom quark case, it's often the case that Higgses can be produced in association with other particles, where the thing that the Higgs is produced in association with aids in your actual identification of those as being Higgs events. So there's four major production modes that I'll discuss. The first is gluon fusion. This is by far the largest cross-section where you just get two gluons fusing to form a Higgs. And this is the most important production mode when looking at the rarer, cleaner processes, because in those cases, all you need is to get enough events to really see them. But it's actually almost, it's very difficult for things like the bottom quark decay because in that case, you have nothing else to assist you in actually identifying the Higgs, and it's a very messy Higgs decay. Instead, we generally look at these rarer processes, where you get either vector boson fusion, where you get a Higgs produced in association with two quarks with particularly distinctive kinematic properties I'll discuss later, or you get the Higgs produced in association with either a vector boson, a W or a Z, or with a top quark pair. And the point is, even though these are rarer processes, because the majority of Higgses decay to BB bar, statistics are less of an issue, and it's more important to be looking at a cleaner final state where you can distinguish your signal from background. So I'll discuss one measurement now in detail, which is looking for H to BB bar in the vector boson fusion final state. To give you a little overview before we get started, kinematically events, this is basically what events look like. We're looking at events that have two B jets, which represent the product of the Higgs decay itself, and then you get two other jets, which are spawned from those quarks that I showed on the previous slide, which have this particularly distinctive property where they have a large angular separation in the longitudinal direction. This is a schematic diagram of Atlas, where you have one proton beam coming in from one side, one from the other, and you got these two jets that are fairly close to this beam line. There are other kinematic differences between this and background processes, but this is generally the main thing. And this is just to show what examples of what events look like. Now to discuss how we actually make these measurements. Generally, there's two basic pieces to making a measurement. The first is you want to have some way of distinguishing your signal from your background. And the second is you need some way of estimating your background quantitatively with systematic uncertainties. So just to show what these events look like, we have a lot of signal events. We have hundreds of signal events, and this is just one region. We actually have multiple. But the issue is we have this overwhelming background because this, there's just a lot of jets, and we're looking at events that just have a lot of jets. So there's two major background processes. The first is Z boson decays to bottom quarks, which are shown in gray. And this looks a lot like our signal process, but just where you replace the Higgs by a Z boson. 
But the other background, this overwhelming background shown in white and blue, is so-called multi-jet, which is just shown schematically in this diagram. And it's just where you get a lot of jets, where you just get gluons or quarks scattering off of each other and producing jets without any W, Z, or Higgs bosons as intermediate things. And effectively, in this analysis, we need to distinguish this relatively small signal from these backgrounds, and we need ways of estimating these two backgrounds. So how do we distinguish signal and background? Well, we have multiple different, we have signal, we have backgrounds. There's multiple kinematic variables that look different between signal and background. Just to show two, the first is this invariant mass calculated between the two jets, which is larger in signal in red than background in black, just because there's a larger angular separation between the jets in our signal process. Another example is just the total number of jets. Our signal process tends to have fewer jets shown in red than the background shown in black. And there's many other variables. We take all these variables. In order to maximize the discrimination between signal and background, we use machine learning to fold all of these variables together into a single classifier that maximizes the discrimination between signal and background. And just to show the product of that, you can look at this figure on the right, where the green shows signal. There's about 10% of events in each bin. These are normalized to one. But then the background, shown in red and black, the vast majority of events are in these first bins, such that there's very few events in these last bins. So for instance, if you just looked at events in the last three bins, say, you keep 30% of your signal, but less than a percent of your background. The other thing that's worth noting is this blue process here is the gluon fusion process I mentioned before. And just to show why it's so difficult, even though there's so many events, it has a very similar distribution as the background, which is just to say it's kinematically very similar to background. So despite its large statistics, it's very difficult to actually see. Now our background estimate. So there's two major backgrounds. The first is this background of Z bosons decaying to bottom quarks. And because this is difficult to model in simulation, we want to model it as well as possible directly from data. So the way this works is we select events in data that have a Z boson decaying to two muons, because this should be kinematically very similar to our background process we care about, but it's very easy to select purely in data. So schematically is what events look like. You have two muons, you have two jets balancing them. We replace these muons by simulated B quarks and therefore B jets. We replace the muons by these B jets. We get this sample of events that effectively look like what ZBB events would look like in data, where the kinematics are largely taken directly from data. And this gives us a direct estimate of this background. Now, the more important background is this non-resonant background, which is just multi-jet production. And the way we actually estimate this comes directly from our multivariate technique that we use in the analysis, which is an adversarial neural net. And effectively, the way this works is, by design, we have this machine learning technique where we decorrelate the invariant mass of the two B jets from the classifier score. And because the vast majority of background events are at low score, and because the mass distribution looks very similar between low score and high score events, we can effectively look at this low score event category where the vast majority of our background events exist, directly take this background shape for this multi-jet background and apply it at high score events. And this allows us to actually directly measure our signal because we can just look at data, we see this, we have this large background, we have data, we subtract the gray background from that ZBB background estimate, we subtract this white background from low score events, and this allows us to actually extract the signal peak. And this actually is what gives us our results. So I mentioned we make a lot of measurements and we look for any deviations from what we expect. And everything I just described was one single measurement. This is the peak we get. We have multiple different regions. We get the signal peak here shown in red compared to black. And all of everything that I just described is just this one entry in this table. And even this is not the only HBB measurement that we make in Atlas. This is just one of them, and there's multiple others. And just to show an example, here's the result of an entirely separate measurement where you're looking for Higgs produced in association with a vector boson, which also produces a peak. And you put these together with another measurement too, and this gives us our actual HBB measurement in Atlas. But even this is just a subset of the full set of measurements because this is just the BB bar final state. And in practice, we make a lot of measurements in a lot of final states, and generally we see things agree pretty well with what we expect. A couple things to note though is, while it's true everything agrees pretty well with what we expect, 
these are pretty large uncertainties in a lot of cases. And in particular, a 10% uncertainty on the HPV measurement is actually larger than the branching fractions to a lot of other final states completely from the LHC. So while it's true that everything tends to agree with the standard model, there's a lot of room still for BSM physics to be hiding. And we're effectively just saying we don't see any large deviations from what we expect so far. Now we have to think about the long-term projection of this measurement. So we're currently here, and I'm showing basically where, if you take these results that I just showed, how would we expect to be doing in a few years' time? So this is where we currently here are at the solid line, and this y-axis is showing the uncertainty on the cross-section measurements. So one thing to note is this gray thing, this gray dotted line, is effectively where we'll be in five years as we collect more data in the so-called LHC run three. So a few years from now, we're still at this point where we're increasing the sensitivity of our measurements simply by collecting more data, which is basically just saying our measurements are still mostly statistically limited, or at least largely statistically limited. So even though new physics, even though we still have large uncertainties, we can still actually improve things in the next few years. The second thing to note is as we go farther in the future, we really hit a systematic floor. We reach the point where simply collecting more data doesn't really help us because the limitation is our systematic uncertainties, not just that we haven't collected enough data. Which means in the long run, if we really want to improve things, we need to improve the way we make measurements and make new types of measurements as opposed to just remaking the same measurements with more data. So now we actually get into the realm of searches instead of measurements. And I'm going to discuss one particular search, as I mentioned, for Di Higgs production in association with a vector boson. But just to mention more broadly why we care about Di Higgs production, we measure a lot of properties of the Higgs boson in the standard model. But one particular measurement that we cannot really make now is the measurement of the Higgs self-coupling, how strongly the Higgs boson couples to other Higgs bosons or how strongly it couples to itself. And this is an important measurement because it effectively allows us to measure what the shape is of the Higgs potential itself. And this is an important property because this Higgs potential is really a fundamental thing in the standard model that if it had a different value, for instance, as it does in a lot of BSM the extensions, we could get scenarios where the universe is unstable and may collapse at any moment. Probably it's fine to think about. But anyway, I don't know. It's an interesting topic. <laughs> now the issue is most measurements of the Higgs boson self-coupling happen in this gluon fusion production mode where you get gluons that fuse to form a Higgs, the Higgs goes to Higgs Higgs, and there's other diagrams. But the thing is, we're still very far from the standard model sensitivity. This plot here is showing just what is our upper limit on this coupling strength when one is what we expect. And you know, we're still setting upper limits that are many times what the standard model expects in ATLAS. And this is why it's important to actually add new channels as opposed to just collecting more data in order to lay the groundwork for future measurements. So I'm going to discuss a new measurement where we're looking for di Higgs production in association with a vector boson. In this case, unlike for measurements where we're really, we know exactly what type of model we're looking for and we're really tuned and optimized for a particular model, in this case, we want to be broad in our coverage, so we try to have a simpler strategy where we're sensitive to a wide range of different models. So in this case, we're really looking for any model that gives us two Higgses produced in association with a vector boson. And just for simplicity, we only consider the BB bar final state because this is where we get enough statistics because we're looking, and this is important because we're looking only at processes with low cross section. So just to show a couple example models that we're considering, the first is what I just showed on the previous slide. Effectively, analogous to the gluon fusion case, this is where you get two Higgses produced in association with a vector boson through this, that involve this Higgs self-coupling scenario. And this is something that's potentially sensitive then to deviations of the Higgs self-coupling. But we also consider models where instead you get new particles in association with the standard model Higgs and not just modifications of the Higgs itself. And this is just one in particular model that we consider, we consider others, where you get one new resonance that decays to a Z and another new resonance that then decays to two Higgses. So effectively, we're introducing two new particles into the theory and seeing if it exists. So the basic pieces of this measurement, of this search really, and the basic pieces of any search compared to measurements is we're really looking for a scenario where, unlike in the previous case, we have actually a very clean final state, but with very few signal events. So it's really a question of being as sensitive as possible and collecting our signal as opposed to background discrimination. But there's four basic pieces here. The first is we simulate our backgrounds where our main backgrounds are top quark pair production. 
and just Z bosons produced in association with B jets, which can look a lot like our signal. We reconstruct various kinematic variables that look different between our signals and backgrounds. And here, for example, is just for that resonant scenario I mentioned, just we're reconstructing directly the masses of the new heavy resonances. We use, again, machine learning to discriminate signal and background. In this case, we just use a boosted decision tree, where it's effectively just, you know, you have a decision tree to discriminate signal and background, but then you feed it into other decision trees effectively. And then we perform a fit. Effectively, we have multiple different regions. Each region has a different amount of signal and background. If you have multiple unknowns and multiple measurements, you can solve them for the thing that you actually care about, which in this case is our signal. Just to give a little info about what the background looks like, so there's, two there's three regions, because we want to be as inclusive as possible, where we look for two Higgses produced in association with a Z boson decaying to neutrinos, a W boson decaying to a charged lepton in a neutrino, or a Z boson decaying to two charged leptons. And I'm just showing here one example kinematic variable, which is the di Higgs mass, which is particularly important for this search. And just to show examples of what the background generally looks like, in the zero and one lepton case, we're generally looking at top quark pair production as a background that we have to discriminate from our signal. And then two lepton case, we're looking for a Z boson production in association with jets that can look like our signal. And generally, okay, so in TT bar, this is the green, the pink, and the orange, which you can see makes up most of the background in these cases. The two lepton channel has a lower cross section for our signal, but also a cleaner background, so it kind of balances out. Now, in this case, as before, we have a lot of kinematic variables that look different from signal and background. Here's a few examples. We fold them into a machine learning algorithm, which I mentioned is a BDT, that gives us a single classifier that we can use to discriminate signal and background. And in this case, we don't do anything so fancy as in, in the previous case. Instead, what we just do is we, have, we divide each category into four different bins based on their, MB, based on their BDT score where the higher score bins have more signal relative to background, the lower score bins are more background relative to signal. We perform a fit, extract our signal. Just to show the four bins for zero lepton here, two lepton here, and in the one lepton case, we even divide things between one positively charged versus one negatively charged lepton because the signal is more positively produced rather than negative. And then we get to our results. So first, non-resonant production. So this is where we're looking for the Higgs self-coupling specifically. So the result is shown on the left for gluon fusion, and the result is shown on the right for this new measurement. And there's a couple things to note. This gives the allowed range of this Higgs self-coupling, which in the gluon fusion case is not that far from one, but we're still fairly far from one, which is the standard model. In this new case, we're actually still quite far from the standard model. It's a lot less sensitive now. And as a result, there's a couple interesting things about this measurement. The first is, even if it's less sensitive now, it's a clean final state, and this is in some sense a prototype of future measurement with a lot more sensitivity once we have a larger data set. The other thing is because we also consider resonant models, because we don't see anything particularly unexpected in the non-resonant case where we don't really expect anything particularly unexpected, it gives us more confidence in the resonant results. Now in the resonant case, we make a lot of interpretations K, I mean, K is a K is a modification to the coupling here. You're we're just introducing a scale factor to the coupling, so where one is just meaning you're keeping it at the standard model value, two is you're doubling the strength of the coupling. It's not predicted exactly by a single theory so much as it's a parameterization of model of. Right, right. Well, if you have a model, if you have a theory that predicts a modification of the coupling, yeah. Right. Right. So that, yeah. Which slide? Oh, oh the, the, the dotted line. So the do, sorry, the dotted lines here are what the signal looks like, but it's normalized to the same normalization as background. So only the shape is interesting. The total normalization is not. Oh, 
Right. Right. Right, right. So the cross sections are very small. And even, so the, if you look at the dotted lines here, this is actually what we get from the fits, but even that's much larger than the standard model expectation. The standard model expectation is very small. I mean, the standard model expectation is not something we can see right now. Now, resonant results, we have a lot of interpretations for a lot of models. I'll just show one that's fairly interesting. So this is where you get this cascade decay, which is a diagram I showed at the beginning, where you have a new resonance decaying to Z plus another new resonance that decays to two standard model Higgses, such that you have a Z and two H's in the final state. So we cover, we do a scan over different masses for the mass of the Z of the new H and the mass of the A. This is what we expect the upper limits to look like. And this is what we observe. And the thing is, if you compare the two, you see a lot more red on the bottom. And just to show why, there's two example plots comparing data and simulation where first we're looking at one comparison of a point that agrees with what we expect, where you see black is data, the histograms are simulation, and you see pretty good agreement between data and simulation. If you look at the bottom, if you take a example point from the red area, you see a larger deviation, where red is the signal, and it looks like data is much more in agreement with signal plus background than it is with background alone. And of course, it's a little circular here because we're, pointing, we're taking a point that's the most different between the top and the bottom and then being surprised that it looks different when you compare data and the background, but we take this into account quantitatively. This is the type of thing that's fairly different and fairly suggestive based on the current data set, but not, sig not significant enough to be able to definitively say anything at this time. And this takes us to the next slide. When we're talking about searches, I mentioned we make a lot of different searches and look for BSM physics. And the thing to note is there's a general opinion that we haven't found anything new with the LHC <laughs> beyond the Higgs, at least, anything unexpected. But one thing to note is we've actually have, based on a lot of searches, found a lot of features that do appear to deviate from the standard model expectation. None of these are extremely large deviations, but any of them could potentially grow as we collect more data. And this is why it's so important to continue looking at more data and collect more data to be able to look at all of these with a larger data set because we should be able to actually confirm or refute all of these. So in each of these cases, what I'm showing is, in red I'm showing atlas results, and this is a full set of some of the most sensitive, atlas, of some of the most significant atlas deviations from the standard model expectation, and blue is a subset of the same for CMS. And this is just to say, you know, this, this y-axis is the so-called global p-value, how likely it is that each of these could just be a background fluctuation. And a lot of these are fairly unlikely, which, you know, of course, we're not, we can't claim anything now, but it is worth noting that we should not discount the possibility that any of these could end up being a real effect once we collect more data. And this brings us to the outlook for the future. So now we have to talk about future data collection with the LHC and future collider results beyond the LHC. So, this plot on the bottom is showing basically a projection, which is potentially now out of date, for how much data we'll have over time. We're currently, we're in the year 2023, and currently we're at the beginning, or we've just started so-called run three, where we're expecting to basically triple our data set based on the, compared to the results that I previously showed. And this is just this area here, effectively. And the thing to note is, by tripling our data set, we're at a point where, unless a result already has three sigma, like the results on the previous slide, we're not going to be able to actually, you know, at that point, we're able to actually confirm or refute those results with this tripling of the data set. But if we look at it, if we try to redo a measurement with more data, with more data, if there's not already a hint of new physics, we're not suddenly going to find new physics. So this has left us at a point right now we're simply redoing searches with a larger data set in the short term is not super interesting unless there's already a hint of new physics as there are on the searches on the previous slide, which is really a relatively small no number over the full set of Atlas searches. And so without a clear idea of where new physics might appear in the short term, we really need to focus on both being broad in terms of introducing new measurements and also trying to actually improve the way we make measurements that affect hopefully benefit a large number of analyses, as large a number of analyses and measurements as possible. And generally, this is on, in the realm more of, of being able to identify different types of particles as will come later. Now, in the long term, 
the picture is actually a bit more complicated. We only have about 5% of, of the total LHC data set such that it's entirely possible that we, when we redo the same searches with more data, new features could basically appear anywhere. Even if we perform a new search somewhere we've already looked, a new feature could pop up even if we haven't seen anything previously. As a result, it's very difficult to predict in the long run where we're most likely to find new physics and also, as is the case in the relatively short term, in, at the moment we really need to lay the groundwork for improving a wide range of different measurements and searches as opposed to simply hyper-optimizing individual searches in the short term. And you can see why this is the case on this plot here. We're looking at the long-term projection, we're really looking at a dramatic increase in our total data set compared to what we currently have. And this brings us to challenges for the future. We need to be able to improve the way we do things in the long term instead of really just hyper-optimizing individual analyses. And I've spent a lot of time in my career focusing on improving the way we reconstruct different types of objects because this is something that automatically improves a wide range of different measurements. And in this context, I'm going to discuss one particular challenge for the future and for the present, which is pileup, which I already mentioned. I already showed schematically this plot, and you can kind of imagine why pileup is an important effect. Pileup is this effect where you get multiple proton interactions happening on top of each other. And you can imagine that, you know, when you're looking, when you get, when you're looking at scenarios where there's all this noise happening on top of other types of objects you're trying to look at, this would have a detrimental effect on our ability to reconstruct different types of objects. And just as to show the schematic example, this is an example where you have 80 interactions happening on top of each other. And in the long run, in the so-called high luminosity LHC, we're looking at scenarios where as many as 200 interactions are happening on top of each other. So I put a lot of work into this, but I'm just going to show one particular somewhat cinematic example of how we've kind of tried to use and suppress pile up in interesting ways in Atlas using detectors in ways that were not originally designed or intended, and in particular, I'm going to discuss how we can actually suppress forward pileup jets. Okay, so the basic issue is, there's two basic regions in the detector, to put it simply. There's a central region where you have coverage from the tracker, which detects charged particles, and you have a forward region where you have no tracker. And the important, reason, the important thing is the tracker allows you to basically unambiguously associate objects to vertices, such that if, jet, if Pile-up jets are in the forward re in the central region. You can directly associate them to pile-up vertices and reject them. For jets in the forward region, this is much more difficult. So the way this process works is we effectively look at central jets. We remove jets in the central region from our particular interaction of interest to start with, just keeping pile-up jets. We look at if any of these pile-up interactions have a momentum imbalance after adding up everything that we see coming from this interaction, we should get a momentum balance because momentum is conserved. So if there's an imbalance, this must indicate that there's something missing. And if you see a forward jet in the same direction as some momentum imbalance from a pileup proton-proton interaction, that's a good indication that it is actually a forward pileup jet. And that's what we've done here where we then have associated this forward jet as a pileup jet by associating it to this missing transverse momentum from a pileup interaction. So this is just some ex one particularly cinematic example of how we can kind of suppress pileup in creative ways and as we've done in Atlas now. Which then gives us this final jet selection where we're removing the pileup jets, we're just left with this central hard scatter jet and these central forward jets. And this is particularly important for certain measurements like that vector boson fusion measurement I mentioned previously because that predicts a lot of forward hard scatter jets. So this brings us to the future, the far future. So I mentioned we currently have about 5%, at least have analyzed about 5% of the total LHC data set. We're currently here, and we will be here in the next 15 years. In the long run, the picture is a lot more complicated because the measurements that we're making now will potentially have a large impact on what future colliders we build. Effectively, if we don't see anything particularly unexpected now, and probably actually no matter what happens, this will be the short-term future, the next instrument we get will be an electron-positron collider, most likely. This allows us to make precision Higgs measurements with, measurements with unprecedented detail, but doesn't allow us to go to higher energy scales to be able to directly probe new physics. And I just, if you're a careful observer, you might notice the background here is the so-called future circular collider, which is one of the, one of the proposed electron-positron colliders, and just it's shown next to the LHC 
for scale and also to show physically where it would be proposed to exist. In other scenarios, if we find physics beyond the standard model at some energy scale in the LHC, this can potentially justify in the long term a larger, more energetic collider in the future where we can potentially probe new physics and actually directly probe new physics at higher energy scales. Possibilities for this are a higher energy proton-proton collider in the much longer term if there's funding, if we have some justification, potentially a muon collider if it is technically feasible in the long term, which would potentially be the best of both worlds for new physics. And this brings us to the end. So a couple things to note. The first is, in run one, this is our picture of measurements of Higgs boson properties. This, is what, this line shows where we expect Higgs boson couplings to be, and these black things with their uncertainties are what we actually measure. And moving from run one to run two, when we collected 13 times more Higgses, you can see how much more precise all these measurements make. In fact, the fact that you can't even really see by eye, the fact that the uncertainties are so small compared to this that you can't really see them is pretty indicative of itself. We've really improved things dramatically with just 13 times more Higgses. In the full LHC data set, we're actually multiplying even this by 26 times. So even if we haven't found new physics so far, the uncertainties are still quite large. It's still entirely possible that as we dramatically improve these measurements, new physics may appear. Which then brings us to now. Now our challenge is to find new physics, which is necessary for the future of the field and funding. And hopefully we find it. And I'm sure you will hear about it if we find something. And that's the end. Thanks, Matt, for this nice talk. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, Matt, I think it was in slide 27, if you could try to go there. Yeah, so <clears throat> here you show the uh, Higgs to BB bar peak, and next to it is uh, Z or W to BB bar, right, the gray? Yes. So what I'm puzzled about is why is the, that W, that vector boson peak on the right, which is W and Z, not wider than on the left where it's just Z, I think, right? Right, so we do suppress, so in the W case it's suppressed, because it's not a BB bar decay. It's, yeah, okay. you get, I mean, you get a so background because easy. you get charm. I mean, a third of W is decay to charm, approximately. And you have charms, fake Bs. So you do get Ws, but it's, it's generally much smaller. All right, I guess that, that covers it. Okay. Other questions? mentioned that it would illuminate stability of the potential. I'm not sure that is true because the triple coupling does it. It can be positive, negative, doesn't really matter. But the quartic coupling would illuminate something. Yeah. So how, so, so I'm, it's not to say that understanding the triple is not relevant. If you knew the peak, you know the peak's mass, you know the triple coupling, then there is a prediction for the quartic coupling so if there are no higher couplings. The problem is, so we have made efforts to study the four Higgs coupling. Okay. The problem is we're so far still from the standard model expectation that at best we can see if there's deviations that are really dramatically large right now. I mean, in Atlas, our sensitivity is such that it's not even necessarily perturbative, the place where we are, so it's not, it's not clear how meaningful it is. I suspect we'll be able to make measurements that are, you know, 30 or 40 times the standard model Even the standard model doesn't really have a good prediction. We don't, we don't know the potential to higher right. orders. We don't know whether there is a fifth order coupling and so on. Right, and so. And there is no, I wouldn't say there is a sort of real prediction. I mean, what I think will happen is we can set cross-section limits on the 
on the four Higgs coupling, or at least on, on three Higgs production, which then you can use to interpret it in terms of a four Higgs coupling, is just the simulation that we have of it is not necessarily extremely reliable. Oh, okay. In which case, we don't necessarily want to tune our measurements very kinematically, I mean, for the exact kinematic that we might expect for a large four Higgs coupling. We can set cross-section limits, okay, though. So what would it take? What much would it have to? I mean, ideally, what we would have from the theory community is a prediction of what the cross-section and kinematic look like for some kinematic variables as a function of the four Higgs coupling. Yeah. I mean, that would be ideal so because then. Predictions like you have made. I mean, because all we've done now basically is simulate it at leading order and see what happens, but there's large interference. Right. So it's not necessarily if it's reliable because it's also a weak process and there's a lot of diagrams. I mean, it's something we're happy to put out a result on if there's interest. Um, just from a purely statistical point of view, the unusual results that you listed, to what degree, I mean, obviously you've made thousands of channels that you've looked in. Are you able to as it were, normalize those, you know, extreme p-values in the context of them just being the, you know, the, yeah. the, that tail of the uh, thousands of channels. It's a bit hard because normally we make a lot of measurements that are not necessarily orthogonal. <laughs> There's a lot of overlap you know, indeed, between indeed. a lot of measurements. Yep. So we don't have a single global measurement. So I, I don't have an exact answer on whether the number of deviations we see from the expectation is what's expected. <laughs> based on the number of measurements we made because there isn't a single measurement of how many measurements we've made. You know, I mean, even, even each of these, even each of those that I showed is already actually multiple measurements have been made at different masses. And then we're looking at the largest deviations from those grids. So I don't have an exact answer. I mean, honestly, for all of these, we have to collect more data and see what happens. Right, and then specifically the, that deed DDX one that hangs at the right hand side with the yeah. lowest p, the smallest p value. I, I don't know. Sorry, I've never asked. What is the, what is that specific measurement? I, I'm not so sure. So in this measurement, it, it's kind of an interesting one because you're using the inner detector in a way that's unexpected. Effectively, you make you're looking for a heavy, stable, charged particle, and such that it's actually moving slowly. <laughs> The measurement is actually a measurement of beta of the particle, which then is significantly less than one for these particles. Mm. And it gives something very different from the expectation. The measurement is not, cons so in Atlas, we also have a cross check where there's a timing measurement in the calorimeter, which is not consistent with this measurement. So there's a few possibilities. It's either a weird signal, like a doubly charged particle, or it's some background mismodeling there are follow-up, there's a, there's a follow-up measurement going on that's looking at it in more detail, so we'll see what happens. And there's going to be a new measurement with more data, as you can expect. Right. So I, I don't know, there's nothing definitive to say without, you know, there's follow-up studies going, so we'll see what happens. Thanks. Other questions? Anyone? Uh, let me ask you one on, I think it's two slides back where you show this uh, AVHH, yeah, this one. So your observed limit is two sigma above the expected all over the place, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, it wasn't clear from the kinematic distribution where it comes from. So, if, so this plot is actually what's showing the non-resonant results. So it's mainly coming from the zero lepton channel and a little bit the one lepton channel. It's just these highest score bins have a little bit more, have a bit more data than is expected. And why there's no sensitivity to lambda? Because uh, lambda should change the kinematics, so I ex expect that you're. Yeah, so generally, these me if you get lambda higher than one, it makes the PT spectra a little bit harder. It also makes the MHH distribution a little bit lower, though. It, sh it shifts values a little lower. So it does, it, and it increases the cross section. So there is some sensitivity. It's just, you know, the stats are so low, there's nothing definitive to say. I mean, in the zero lepton channel, for instance, there's about, in this highest score band, there's about two events expected and five observed, which is interesting, but it's not enough to say anything definitive. You know, as with anything else, uh, the theme is, you know, for a lot of these searches, collecting more data is really useful. Luckily, we're collecting more data.
All right, uh, last chance for questions. If not, let's uh, thank Matt again.